and we'll probably be there for a while, a while in this, uh, because the Feast of Trumpets, and just to refresh our minds uh, just a little bit, is made up of three feasts, and that is the, or the Feast of Tabernacles, excuse me, is made up of three feasts, and that is the Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, and it's really all part of the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. And when we get into atonement, if anybody wants to read ahead, that's that's where we're headed to, is the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is a, uh, I, I believe in my heart, this is what the trumpets was all about, was the announcement of the Day of Atonement. I believe that with all my heart. That's what the trumpet was for, was an announcement. And um, in the book of Numbers 29, the Bible says, one through six, and in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. For you, it is a day of the blowing of trumpets. You shall offer a burnt offering as a sweet aroma to the Lord, one young bull, one ram, and seven lambs in the first year without blemish. Their grain offering shall be for fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephah for the bull, two tenths for the ram, and one tenth for each of the seven lambs, also one kid of the goats, as a sin offering. To make atonement for you, besides the burnt offering with its grain offering for the new moon, the regular burnt offerings with its grain offering and their drink offerings, according to their ordinances, a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire. So if, you, so if you look at this and look at it slowly, just slow down. You shall offer a burnt offering as a sweet aroma to the Lord. So this is a sweet aroma. All right. And then, it, then he says, also one kid of the goats is a sin offering to make atonement. To make atonement for you, besides the burnt offering for the, it goes again to the sweet aroma. So, so you see in this picture the blowing of the trumpets, a festival to the Lord. But what it's doing, the trumpets blowing is assembling the people unto the Lord. That is what the blowing of the trumpets is, is a call to assembly. A call to assembly. In the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 10, we're 29 and we're going to go backwards to chapter 10. And, uh, and I love this in uh, Numbers 10. It says, and the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. So you are to make two trumpets of silver. And these two trumpets are for the calling of the con congregation. There are four distinct sounds. I know Apostle Paul gets into distinct sounds in, in the book of Corinthians, but these trumpets were for a distinct sound to the children of Israel. And in verse 3, it says, When they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. So when both of the trumpets were blown, there was a gathering together of all the congregation at the door. 
Who's the door? Jesus said, I am the door. So, so the blowing of the trumpet gathers the people together unto the Lord. That's even what I believe Paul says in, in the book of Thessalonians, uh, that, and I'll probably be out of, uh, won't quote it just right, but the trump shall sound, and those who live and, re and are remain shall be called up in the clouds unto who? The Lord. So it's an assembling unto the Lord. That's the purpose of the trumpet is to assemble the people unto the Lord. And la last week we looked at the voice of the trumpet, that John heard a voice. He heard a voice as a trumpet. And he turned to see the voice and see, when you turn to see the voice, you hear the words, the voice is saying, because a voice has words. A voice is made up of words. So, so, and there's a distinct sound in the voice. And what John saw in this voice was the person. So the words that John saw were gathered up into the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we hear that? So he heard a voice. He turned to see the voice. The voice was as a trumpet. And what was John gathered to? He was gathered to the Lord. His mind was all at once on the Lord and he saw him in the midst of the church, and he saw him unlike any way he had, he had probably ever seen Jesus before. So, so everything of John was assembled unto the Lord. So the assembly of the congregation of Israel was to the Lord, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and and God spoke of that old covenant temple as the place that he would meet with them. So God meet, met with Israel from the tabernacle of congregation. That's where God met with them. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's where the voice of the Lord was known was in the tabernacle. All of that was there in the old covenant and they were assembled together by the blowing of the trumpets and these trumpets in numbers were made you know we, we we looked at trumpets last week that were made of the ram's horn and now we're looking at trumpets this week that are made of silver and if you search your bible silver speaks of the redemption of christ so it was a sound of redemption. A people, and, and, and I want us to hear redemption tonight. If, if you don't hear anything else I'm going to say to you, I want you to hear a couple things distinctly. I want you to hear the assembling to the Lord. I want you to hear that. That's what you're called to is the assembling of the Lord, and you're redeemed unto him. You're not just redeemed out of sin. You're redeemed to him. That's, that's a big deal. Because so many people may say, well, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. And they don't understand that they are redeemed to a place. It's the same thing that Christians say, well, I'm not in sin anymore. Or I come out of Egypt. But they don't come to the place. So, so the sound of the trumpet is to bring us together unto the Lord into the Lord in a very specific way, and that's the way of redemption. Glory to God.
So it's not just to the Lord, but it's in the way of redemption. So, so as we look at this in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says here, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Now that right there is mouthful. Just, just that. All utterance and all knowledge is enriched by Jesus Christ. Do you consider that? All utterance, all knowledge. And this is and this is where Paul goes on in here. He says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son. So here's the call of the trumpet right here. To the fellowship of his son. He just told you that all wisdom or all knowledge, and you can say all wisdom, but all utterance and all knowledge is enriched by him. So you're called to the door. I am the door of the assembly. And this is the fellowship of God's son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, that's another mouthful. Perfectly joined together. No division. Same mind and same judgment. Glory to God. Now, all of this is accomplished by the fellowship of his son. So this is where we have great fellowship with one another is in the fellowship of God's son. And that is in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the all-inclusiveness of Jesus Christ. And when you get into his resurrection, you get into his, his glory his nature, his throne, his dominion, his, you, you know, his magnification, his exceeding great power. So, so that's our fellowship. And when Paul wrote this, just to, just to focus here for a moment, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know what people do with that what someday when he comes and then he's going to confirm you to the end that you would be blameless I, I know now now look at this word coming it's the word revelation so it's actually the apocalypse that waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ who shall confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in 
the light or the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, revelation is the light of the day. The revelation of him is the light of his coming. Because in the revelation, we see the light of the day. That's what we see. We don't see the light of this day through sun, moon, or stars. We see the light of this day through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And that's how we're confirmed in him. To be holy and blameless in him. See, I can't, <laughs> I can't find myself holy and blameless anywhere but in the seeing of Christ. I can't do it. I'll find myself anything but that, but in the seeing of him. <laughs> See, but when that light comes of him, There is where you're blameless and righteous because you see the work of redemption of Christ. You begin to see what he's done. And you see that by revelation, by revealing of him by the Spirit. And that's how you come into the light of the day. Amen? That you can walk in the new day. You're walking in a new day. And that new day has nothing to do with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. It has to do with the revealing of Jesus Christ. And that's where we find ourselves righteous, holy, at peace with God. See, that's the fellowship called you know, the voice of the trumpet calls us, and that's what John saw. He saw the fellowship of Jesus Christ in the church, in the book of Revelation. He saw him in his fullness in Revelation chapter 1 in the church, in the seven golden candlesticks. That's where fellowship's at. Even with one another. That's how we come to love one another. It's through the knowing of him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, says, and they sing a new song. We could go all day on a new song. And it's a song of redemption. Worthy art thou to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou was slain and did purchase unto God with thy blood men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and made them to be unto our God a kingdom and priests. I know King James says kings and priests. Another translation says a kingdom of priests. And they reign upon the earth. I see and hear so much here. He purchased us to himself. See, God didn't just purchase us from sin. He purchased us to himself that we would be made to him. And how we're made unto him a kingdom and priesthood is through the fellowship of his son. 
That's how we're made unto him what he's after. It's through the fellowship of Christ. I can't be made no other way. So he made us priests unto God. But being made a priest unto God, in the old covenant, you, you had the goods. You were of the right lineage. You had to be of Aaron to be a priest. So you had to be of the Levitical priesthood to be a priest. And you had to have the goods. You know, they had their assignment. They had their goods. They had their office of a priesthood. So to be a priest unto God, a kingdom of priests, we're of the lineage of the priest. And he's filling us with that of himself. That we can minister bread and wine in the earth. See, see, it's this feeling of Christ that we've come to here in tabernacles. And I'm going to get way ahead of myself. But that's what this tabernacles is about. It, it, we talked about it the first, I think the first night, the ingathering of the fruit of God being gathered up in you and I. That's what God is after, that, that, that our fruit, Jesus said in the book of John might remain so that our fruit remains so in every situation we can give unto those in need. Be a priest to them. I, I'm, I'm serious. God is after his body to be a priest of him in the earth, of him. And this is through a divine knowing of God. That's what you're called to, to know him in his fullness. That's why John sees his fullness in the church. He sees all that Christ has done feet as brass, eyes as a flame of fire, hair white as wool. And he sees it in the church because it's gathered up in the church. And that's the call to assembly. That everything would be gathered up of him in the church. And the church would make known, as Paul said, the manifold wisdom of God. Amen. Amen. So, so again, when we go in situations, and the Lord just reminded that my heart, the Lord, Lord is really in funerals. I've ministered a number of funerals of people that have known the Lord. And by going into those funerals and presenting the life of Christ, it changes the whole direction. Really. Really. Because you're bringing in the substance of God. You're bringing in a clarity to hearts and minds. They, they may not fully comprehend it, but they're hearing. They're not dead. They're not dead. Their bodies have died, but they're not dead. He that believeth in me, Jesus said, shall never die. Believest thou this? So bodies, physical bodies, doesn't separate us from Christ. Nothing, Paul says, shall separate us from Christ. 
And when we bring that into the midst of a people, the reality of that, when that is real in us, that your hope is in Christ Jesus, it changes situations. And that's, that's what I'm hearing God speak to me about this Feast of Tabernacles is, is the people with the fruit of God in them and the fruit of God coming out of them to people in need, to other members of the body. You know, fruit in the natural isn't made <laughs> to just sit on a tree. It's made to be eaten, to, to, for somebody to partake of it. So as Christ is gathered up in us, he, he's gathered up in us for us to distribute out of ourselves, out of our bellies, out of our innermost being, living water. That's what Jesus said. Out of you shall flow living water. So we've been caught up in the taking in, but God is also not wanting us just to take in. He's wanting us to distribute that of him. Amen? In, in 1 Peter, in Ephesians 1, I, I, I probably mentioned this to you last time, but it's so profound in me. I want to mention it. 1 Peter 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Beth Bethnia. I'm probably not pronouncing that correct. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, and to the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a living hope, lively hope. And, and if you look up this word lively, it means to live. I mentioned this Sunday morning in our local assembly. It means to live. So this could be translated that he has begotten us again to live in expectation by the resurrection of Jesus Christ or to a living expectation. You were begotten the first time in death, but in Christ you're begotten to a living expectation. by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fate of not our way reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through the faith unto the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So we, we are again, we come unto him. We're called unto him. And in the calling unto him, Peter says, we're begotten unto a living hope. See, in Adam, we had no living hope. In Adam, from the time we were born, we knew we were going to die. I think Brother Bob or somebody said this Sunday that the natural man, from the time he's born, he's told he's dying. All right, so when you're born again in Christ, you're begotten to a living hope, to an inheritance incorruptible. And, and people, you know, in their mind, they, they, they look at that in the natural realm, the incorruptible inheritance of God. Well, what's incorruptible? Well, Peter tells us later on, I believe in this same chapter, that, we are, that we're not purchased by corruptible things like silver and gold, 
but by the blood of Christ. And then he tells us that we're born of the incorruptible seed of God. So that substance that's in the seed is our incorruptible inheritance. That's our inheritance. What is in the seed? And that's what the ingathering is, is gathering up the substance of the seed, the fruit of the seed. Right? God planted a seed in the earth, and the seed he planted was Jesus Christ, and he's looking for the substance of the seed, and he's gathering that substance up into a people. So you're begotten of the incorruptible seed of God. So the, the substance that's in the seed produces that that's incorruptible in us to a living expectation. So, so to live, to live in Christ, to have his life in us, that's the expectation. That's the, that's the harvest. His life dwelling in us. You know, we know Christ is in us. But his substance dwelling in us. I mean, we read these scriptures about transformation. We've read them for years. Many of us have taught on renewing of the mind and transformation for years and years. Well, well, what that means is there's a place where that really happens. <laughs> we read them, and we talk about the transformation. And maybe we still have it over there to a certain degree. But the transformation is that that's in our soul coming to that which is him. See, that's a, that's a great transformation. If the substance of my heart would be that which is Christ, not that of the earth. Would that not be a great transformation? Would that not be a great renewal of the mind? If my mind was, uh, was in the substance of Christ, hey amen, that would be. That would be. Glory to the Lamb of God. And I, and I believe we'll look at more of this in the Day of Atonement. But but one last thing here, and, uh, and, and see what time it is. I may read one, one more scripture. We'll see. In, in 1 Peter here, in verse 13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace. And that word end, again, is, I believe, dealing with the goal. The end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So their expectation here, I see it in Peter, I see it in Titus, I see it in Corinthians. They're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ, just like the church has done all these years. But they're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ, not outwardly, but inwardly. They're still looking for his appearing, but it's where they're looking for the appearing at, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, so Peter deals with them uh, about the manifold trials and temptations and so forth and speaks of the salvation that will be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because it's, again, going back to, to 1 Corinthians, 
It's in the revealing of him that we begin to see we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when we begin to see that, our soul is transformed. When we begin to see him as our righteousness, our soul is transformed that we can put off these works of darkness. We can put off the old man. You know, he didn't just crucify the old man to never be put off in the church. He didn't do that. He crucified the old man that we put him off. And we put him off through the knowing of Jesus Christ, through transformation, through the putting off. Because we put on his life. We've read that, right? We've read that we're clothed up on with him. We've read these scriptures. Well, folks, I believe this is a real living expectation to come into the hearts of God's people, that the very living life of Christ would be manifest out of their being because their being is in Christ. We've read that I don't know how many times. If you be in Christ, you are a new creature. And the fullness of that creature is the substance of Christ himself, our creation, your new creation. If any man be. So that's where the being's at, is in Christ. So we come to that fellowship of him that trumpet sounds, that voice begins to sound, and it tells us we're made one with him, we're joined to him, we're in union with him in his death, burial, and his resurrection. Amen. See, one last thing on the voice. I was going to read Ephesians 1, but we've read it, and you all can go read it, about the inheritance that's in Christ and the redemption of the purchased possession to when you read that in Ephesians 1 the redemption of the purchased possession it's to the praise of his glory what the purchased possession is redeemed to, to be is the praise of his glory is to manifest him. I believe in their bodies. In the earth. Amen. To overcome. We talk about overcoming. But to overcome. The things of the world. He overcome all things. So he has victory over all things. So in Hebrews 1. The Bible says. And we know this scripture. Verse 1. Just verse 1. God who at sundry times in divers' manners spake, so here's the voice, in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath, I said just one verse, two verses, hath in the last day spoken, so here's the voice, unto us by his son or in son. So all speaking, even the speaking of the spirit is right here. He shall take of me and show me to you, Jesus says. So, so the sounding of the trumpet is to gather us to what God has done in his son. And what God has done in his son is to be made manifest in our hearts that it be manifest through our bodies. Amen. That it actually touched the earth. Jesus actually touched the earth. Did he not? Yes, he did. He didn't just have all this spiritual understanding and not affect the earth. He affected the earth. He affected everyone around him. So did 
look at Peter and Paul. Did they not turn cities? The Bible said they turned cities upside down. They affected the earth. Because there was a manifestation of him that was within them. So it affected the earth. Amen. Well, that's what we're called to. We're called to the fellowship of him. That's what the voice brings us out to. Is to the fellowship of him and how we fellowship him is by him being revealed in us. That's how we fellowship him. Anyway, I'll stop right here tonight. And we'll continue on in this study next week. Lord willing, but we'll stop here tonight and, and, and uh, see Sister Peggy and Brother Larry there. So I'm going to go to them first. Sister Peggy, if you're there and you can, just unmute yourself and speak up. <laughs>